Hello everyone, this is Professor Roman. Let's continue the group theory lectures. Let's now talk about conjugacy in the symmetric groups. This is a remarkable story. In general, for arbitrary groups, it can be very difficult to tell when two elements are conjugate. As an example of that, if you studied linear algebra, you're familiar with similarity of matrices. Two matrices are similar. Let me write this down here. B and A are similar. If you have a relationship like that, or you can put the inverse on the other side, because P is invertible, Q is invertible. Well, this is conjugation. Okay. B is a conjugate of A. It, it's, you'll know if you studied linear algebra that it's not so easy to tell when two matrices are similar. Or, in other words, when they're conjugate. What's remarkable is that in the most complex of finite groups, the symmetric groups, it's quite easy to tell when two matrices, oh, <laughs> two matrices, when two uh, permutations are conjugate. So let's start our journey by, ex let's explore this issue. Where would we start determining conjugacy, how to tell when two permutations are conjugate. Place to start is by conjugating some permutations and seeing what they look like. And the place to start that is with the simplest types of permutations, namely cycles. So let's say we have a k cycle, a1 through a k, and we want to conjugate it by sigma. This is the notation and this is our definition. We, we put the sigma inverse on the right rather than on the left, but it amounts to the same thing. Since this expression begins with sigma inverse, we're not necessarily interested in applying this to a, an a sub i, but if we apply it to a sigma a sub i, we're going to get somewhere more easily. So here is sigma a sub i, here is the permutation, the conjugate, applied to sigma a sub i. The sigma inverse and the sigma cancel, and we get this. Now we know a sub i, a sub i goes to a sub i plus 1, or to a1 when i is k, and so we get this. So the conjugate here that we're investigating sends sigma ai to sigma ai plus 1 when i is less than k and wraps around. Sigma ak is sent to sigma a1. Moreover, if x is not one of these elements that we are applying the permutation to, then sigma inverse of x is not in the underlying set of sigma, so sigma inverse of x is not moved by this cycle. So you could pretend this cycle wasn't there, and you'll have sigma sigma inverse of x, which is x. So uh, x is fixed by this conjugate. And I have just described for you this cycle sigma a1 through sigma ak. The conjugate advances each of these to the next one with wraparound and leaves everything else fixed. So we have this formula, and in words, to conjugate a cycle by sigma, all you have to do is, mult is apply sigma to each element in the cycle. Nothing could be simpler than that. You don't have to mess with sigma inverse. It's all very straightforward. 
Note also that unlike the case for powers, a conjugate of a case cycle is another case cycle. because these will all be distinct. <clears throat> so here's an example. This is a five cycle. We want to conjugate it by this permutation. All we do is apply this permutation to each of these elements. Sigma 3, sigma 2, sigma 5, sigma 4, sigma 1. And here's a good place for commas. It kind of makes it easier to read. I could use wider spaces, but uh, I wanted to show you how it looks with commas. So this is not an ordered 5-tuple. It is a 5-cycle. And it's this 5-cycle. So we know how to conjugate a cycle. Very simple. What about conjugating an arbitrary permutation tau by a permutation sigma? Well, in view of what we've just learned, it makes sense to first write the cycle decomposition for tau. And because conjugation by sigma is a homomorphism, in fact an automorphism, called an inner automorphism, <clears throat> the conjugate of tau is just the product of the conjugates of each cycle. And these are pairwise disjoint. So this is in fact the cycle decomposition of this conjugate, the conjugate of tau by sigma. Because these are pairwise disjoint cycles. Their product is this permutation here, so it's the cycle decomposition. Therefore, conjugate permutations have the same cycle structure. Tau conjugated by sigma has the same cycle structure as tau. C1 and C1 sigma have the same length, so we get the same cycle structure. Well, now if you were doing this, you know, if you were the first one to invent all this, to, or I'm sorry, to discover all this, you would now be saying, wow, it would seem almost too good to be true, but maybe the converse is true. Maybe if two permutations have the same cycle structure, they have to be conjugate. That would be terrific, <clears throat> because then it would be easy to tell when two permutations were conjugate, you just look at their cycle structures, see if they're the same or not. Well, <clears throat> the place to start, as usual, is with the simplest case. Suppose we have two cycles. For them to have the same cycle structure, they have to have the same length. But all we have to do now is define a permutation that sends AI to BI. Because then when we, and then it can do anything you want to other elements of the set capital X, or in, we're doing SN, then um, the other integers uh, from 1 to N that are not included here. You can send them anywhere you want as long as you do it bijectively. Okay. <clears throat> well, then you have a permutation that does this, and so when you conjugate tau by sigma here, <clears throat> it's this cycle conjugated by sigma. You apply sigma to each element in the cycle, you get these elements, which is mu. And then, lo and behold, tau and mu are conjugate because they are cycles with the same cycle structure, the same length. <clears throat> so here's an example. Here is a tau and here is a mu in S7. If sigma is defined this way, it is in fact, this is in fact sending, we have to send 5 
to 3, which this does. We have to send 3 to 4, which this does. We have to send 4 to 2, which this does. We have to send 1 to itself, which this does. We have to send 2 to 5, which this does. And we have 6 and 7 that are not mentioned here. We could send 6 to itself, we could send 7 to itself, or we could send 6 to 7 and 7 to 6. None of that matters because when we conjugate tau by sigma, the issue of where 6 and 7 go doesn't matter because we just apply sigma to each of these. So we have this conjugation. What about the general case? <clears throat> well, again, we've, we've solved the problem for cycles, so we'll take our two arbitrary permutations and write out their cycle decomposition, including the one cycles. And we arrange the factors in order so that ci and di have the same length. Corresponding cycles have the same length. Now what we did for cycles before, we can extend to the cycle, the products of cycles. We can find a single permutation sigma that does that's, that does what we want it to do, which is send an element to the corresponding element, send an element of C1 to the corresponding element in D1. They have the same length, so that works out. Then send the elements in C2 to the corresponding elements in D2, and so on. That will define a single permutation on the underlying sets for tau and we can extend that by sending any other elements that are not part of the underlying structure here, the underlying set, um, <clears throat> anywhere we want bijectively. <clears throat> and so then the conjugate of tau by sigma will be the product of these conjugates, which is the product of the d's, which is mu. So you might want to fiddle with this a little bit if it's not quite clear. Uh, it's a little bit subtle, so there, it might take a little bit of time to digest. Um, so maybe I should have included an example, but I didn't, so my bad but it would be good practice for you to create your own example, frankly. All you need to do is maybe make, uh, let's see, where are they again? Uh, <coughs> give tau, you know, a cycle, a pr make tau a product of two cycles or three cycles and mu also. Same, same uh, cycle structure and see how you'd match everything up. Once you do this once, you'll see immediately what's going on. So the summary is that to conjugate a cycle in Sn by sigma, we just apply sigma to each element of the cycle. <clears throat> if tau has this cycle decomposition, then its conjugate by sigma is the product of the conjugates of the cycles. And this is the cycle decomposition of tau sigma. Two permutations are conjugate in Sn if and only if they have the same cycle structure. That's a marvelous result. <clears throat> now this theorem implies that the conjugacy classes, remember, conjugacy is an equivalence relation. Its equivalence classes are called conjugacy classes. They are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the cycle structures. So I've drawn a picture here of S4, and we know exactly what the conjugacy classes are. 
they correspond to the different possible cycle structures. <clears throat> so we would describe these conjugacy classes as all permutations composed of one four cycle. That's one possible cycle structure. All permutations composed of one three cycle and one one cycle, or two two cycles, or one two cycle and two one cycles, or four one cycles. Those are the possible cycle structures. They look like this in the common notation for cycle structures. These are the dot patterns. I'm actually leaving it for the exercises for you to verify a formula for the number of permutations in each conjugacy class of SN. Uh, how many permutations are there with a given cycle structure? And I'll let you ponder that. Uh, it's not something we're going to need in this course, but in certain quarters it is something that is considered important. <clears throat> the set AN, denoted commonly by AN, of all even permutations in SN is a subgroup of SN. It's called the alternating group, which is why I use the letter A. And for n bigger than or equal to 2, the order of the alternating group is one-half the order of Sn, the full group. And a relatively easy way to see that is to consider this map that sends um, <clears throat> sigma to the product, transposition 1, 2, times sigma. This is a bijection from the even permutations to the odd permutations. If sigma is even, then it's a product of an even number of transpositions, therefore this is a product of an odd number of transpositions. So all you have to do is show this is a bijection, which is pretty straightforward. There's no standard notation or terminology, as far as I know, for the family of odd permutations. And that's probably because that is not a subgroup. So you can't work with it uh, so easily. Well, let us now turn to a promise I made earlier about proving Cayley's theorem. We're now in a position where we can give a proof. But I'm going to begin with an example. The Klein 4 group, as you may recall, the Vieira group denoted by V, is the direct product of two cyclic subgroups of order 2. So we get four ordered pairs. This doesn't look at all like permutations. They're just ordered pairs. However, Consider the function that sends the 4 group into the symmetric group S4. It has, it's got to be, I want it to be a group homomorphism, so I want to send the identity to the identity, and I'm going to send uh, the order pair A1 to this product of transpositions. A2 goes, uh, I'm sorry, the order pair 1B goes here, the order pair AB goes here. And actually, I left it for an exercise for you to figure out how to read my mind here. How did I come up with this function? <clears throat> this function is injective. That's just easy to see. Its image is, in fact, a group of size 4. It's a subgroup of S4. S4 has size 24, but this is a subgroup of size 4. It is also, in fact, a homomorphism, and that makes it an embedding. And to show that it's a homomorphism, we have to show it preserves the group product. 
Here's an example. If I apply the function to the product of these two ordered pairs, the product of these ordered pairs is 1b, because a squared is 1, and that's this. If instead I apply the function to each factor, I get this product, which also works out to be, let me pull this down here some more, which works out to be the same, 1, 3, 2, 4, 1, 3, 2, 4. So you can check the rest of it. It's tedious, but not very difficult. <clears throat> and you will see that this is, in fact, an embedding. So the Klein 4 group is isomorphic to this subgroup of S4. Now, in keeping with our convention that any group that is isomorphic to a named group, such as quaternion group, for example, or the Klein 4 group, can also be referred to by that name. They're isomorphic, essentially the same group, same group structure, deserves the same name we can say that S4 contains a Klein 4 group as a subgroup. Okay. You might hear it more commonly said that S4 contains an exact copy or an isomorphic copy of the Klein 4 group. Okay. Whatever. Now we can address Cayley's theorem in general. <clears throat> This is actually our first example of a representation, something we talked about when we talked about common themes in group theory. We can represent the elements of one group, say G, by the elements of another group, and in this case we're talking about the symmetric group on the underlying set of G. How do we do that? Each element of G can be represented by the left multiplication by that element map, mu sub A. So the element is A. The representation of A is mu sub A. It maps the group to itself, multiply by A on the left. This is a bijection on the set G. And so it belongs to S sub G. In this context, mu sub A is often referred to as left translation by A. I think I mentioned that before. I also mentioned that knowing mu sub a is equivalent to knowing a. You can go back and forth between the two. So this is a faithful representation. So every element, little a in a group, any group, can be uniquely represented by a left translation map. The representation map looks like this. It maps g to a the symmetric group on G, it takes little a to mu sub a. It's an embedding. Here is the reason. And mu sub a equals mu sub b implies a equals b. So we get a faithful representation. Every element of G is faithfully represented by a permutation. Different elements of G are represented by different permutations. And this gives us, this embedding tells us that the group G has an, an isomorphic copy, an exact copy, within the symmetric group S sub G. It may also have an, an isomorphic copy in other symmetric groups. Uh, that may or may not be the case, but it, it well, it will. Yes, it will. But um, 
it doesn't matter. The point here is it has a faithful representation, an exact copy in some symmetric group. So that is the content of Cayley's theorem. Every group G is isomorphic to a subgroup of the symmetric group S sub G via the left translation representation map, the map that sends A to mu sub A, multiplication on the left by A. And this representation is called the left regular representation of G in S sub G, the symmetric group. Another somewhat less specific way to say this, to state Cayley's theorem, is to say that every group is isomorphic to a permutation group. Remember, that means a subgroup of a symmetric group. It doesn't tell us which symmetric group, but it gets the main point across. And there is a bonus, you might say, uh, that we get from Cayley's theorem. Sometimes it's very useful, sometimes it's not. During your studies of group theory, you may find yourself wondering whether or not there's a group that possesses a certain isomorphic invariant property, a property that uh, is shared by groups that are isomorphic such as a certain group of certain order, for example. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, <clears throat> this could happen when you are, for example, trying to find a counterexample to some result that you want to show basically is false. Uh, Cayley's theorem might be just the thing you need because it says that there is a desired a group with the desired property, the property you're looking for, if and only if there's a permutation group that has that property. So one sure place to look for an example or a counterexample is in some symmetric group. And we will do this later on in the book, quite a bit later actually. We are going to wonder if there are any non-abelian groups of order P, Q, where P and Q are distinct primes. Where are we going to look in a symmetric group? The trick, of course, is which symmetric group and that's not so easy. This doesn't reduce the problem to triviality. <clears throat> it just gives you some confidence that if there is such a group, we, we know that there has to be among the symmetric groups. Uh, so, as I said before, sometimes that's quite useful, sometimes it's not. Okay. Actually, the first thing you might want to do if you're looking for an example of a group with a certain property or a a, a counterexample <clears throat> is to scan through your favorite groups, which I guess everybody has. Uh, cyclic groups, Klein 4 group, quaternion groups, maybe the dihedral groups, and so on, the ones you're familiar with. <clears throat> um, it, but if they don't work out, you know that the group you're seeking, if it exists, must lie in some symmetric group. So now I want to, before we conclude on symmetric groups and go on to free groups, I want to talk just very briefly <clears throat> about how Galois viewed groups. We won't be using this material subsequently, so if you not interested, you can skip ahead, it's, but it's only, I don't know, page and a half or so, it's not a lot. <clears throat> Motivated as Gawa was, and others, by the theory of algebraic equations, Gawa was interested in, sol in solutions to algebraic equations, <clears throat> Also, by number theory, 
by various geometric ideas as others were. Several mathematicians made early contributions to group theory in the late 1700s and the early 1800s. Group theory sort of blossomed. <clears throat> Here are some of those mathematicians. I put them in alphabetical order so we get no complaints. <clears throat> Niels Heinrich Abel, Augustin Louis Cauchy, Arthur Cayley of Cayley's Theorem, Everest Galois, Joseph Louis Lagrange, Paolo Ruffini, Alexandra Theophile Vandermond, or Theophile, I don't know how he pronounced it. In any case, <clears throat> despite the fact that Lagrange and Vandermond contributed in some way to the development of the theory of groups in the late 1700s, it wasn't until the early 1800s when things really got cooking. In 1846, it was the publications of Cauchy and Galois, <clears throat> but you'll notice Galois died in 1832. His work was, the publication was delayed till later. That's another story. Um, so his work was published posthumously, unfortunately. Uh, that's really the beginning of modern group theory. So in the early, in the first half of the 1800s, let's say. Galois' motivation for his work with groups was the desire to understand how to find solutions of polynomial equations. He may have been the first person to use the term group, but his version of a group is quite different from the modern version that we're studying now. So here is what Galois did. Here, here is Galois' uh, view of groups. We start with a, a finite set of distinct symbols, call it X, and consider tables in which each row contains an ordered arrangement of the elements of X. So in this case, X is A, B, C, D, E, and these are ordered arrangements of those letters. Then each ordered pair of rows, say row I, row J, or just the indices I and J, the row indices, defines a permutation, which I'll call pi sub I, J, a permutation of X, and just as an example, if we take row 1 and row 3 here, we take both these rows, we stick them in a two-row matrix, and we have a permutation. Now, I'm not thinking of these as we talked about ordered arrangements and how they don't exactly relate to cycles. I'm not thinking of these as permutation in the sense that they map 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 to A, B, C, D, E, and so on. Now, I'm, I'm, we take two rows, stick them in a matrix, and this defines a permutation. A is sent to B, B is sent to C, C is sent to E, D is fixed, E is sent to A. Now, <clears throat> Galois considered those tables, let's say N row tables, with the additional property that the sets A sub I, these are all the permutations whose domain is the ith row and whose codomain is the jth row. So I sub 1, 3. Row 1 goes at the top here, row 3 goes at the bottom. This is a bijection whose domain is ordered like this, and his codomain is ordered like this. So these are ordered sets. So we take all the permutations that send the i-th row to 
any of the other rows, including itself. The ith row is sent to the other rows, or the same row, of the table. Galois considered tables like this for which these sets, a sub i, are the same for all rows, r sub i. So the permutations that map the first row to the other rows are the same as the permutation that maps the second row to the other rows. When I say other, I mean including their itself. So a sub i equals a sub j for all i and j. And I'll refer to this as a Galois table. So let's consider now <clears throat> a table of ordered arrangements. If it is a Galois table, then in modern language, A sub i is actually a subgroup of the symmetric group, S sub x. To see this, what we need to do is show that A sub i is closed under product, composition. The identity belongs to A sub i because one of the permutations in this set, when j equals i, is the permutation that maps rho i to itself, which is the identity. But all we need to do is show that it's closed under product. As we know, that's for a finite group, that's or a finite set, that's sufficient to guarantee closure under identity and inverses. <clears throat> so here's a product, pi i k, pi i j, a product of two permutations from the set a sub i. <clears throat> and we want to show that belongs to a sub i. Well, because of the condition, the Galois table condition, <clears throat> the permutation pi i k is equal to some permutation pi j l in a j. Okay? Because a sub i equals a sub j, this permutation in a sub i is also equal to a permutation of this form in a sub j. All I need to do now is replace pi i k with pi j l You'll see what, why this is in a minute. Now, look at this product. This sends row i to row j, and it's followed by a permutation that sends row j to row l. Therefore, it's a permutation that sends the permutation that sends row i to row l, and it belongs to a i. So it's this ability to replace a pi i k by a pi j l that gives you the closure under product. So a sub i is a subgroup of the symmetric group on x. <clears throat> For someone who didn't maybe understand uh, closure or didn't work explicitly with closure, this was a very clever idea. The converse also holds. Suppose that one of the sets a sub, a sub i <clears throat> defined by a table t happens to be a subgroup then we want to show that table is in fact a Galois style table. So we want to show that aj equals ai for all j. Well, <clears throat> if we, so at this moment ai is fixed, i is fixed, and we're trying to show aj equals ai. So we take an element, a permutation, pi jk from aj. Pi jk is equal to pi ik pi ji. 
because again, this is the permutation that sends row j to row i, followed by the one that sends row i, I to row k, so we're going from j to k. And I can rewrite this a sub i k, and now a pi sub, did I say a pi sub i k? Now pi sub j i is pi sub i j inverse. Just map the rows back. Instead of mapping j to i, go from i to j, you've got the inverse. But a sub i is assumed to be a subgroup. Each of these has first subscript i. They belong to a i. The inverse belongs to a i, therefore, and so does the product. So pi j k belongs to a i. That means that any permutation in a j is also a permutation in a i. And that's true for all j. And that implies that a j equals a i. And I'll let you fill in the slight gap there. So t is a Galois table. So in view of this analysis, we can now see that Galois tables correspond precisely to the subgroups of the finite symmetric groups on finite sets X. Moreover, in view of Cayley's theorem, which was in 1854 after Galois's work, it turns out that Galois was actually working with all finite groups up to isomorphism. And on an historical note, Galois' work was not published until 1846, which was 14 years after his death. Galois died in a duel at age 20. But by 1846, by the time Galois' work was published, the theory of finite symmetric groups had been formalized by Cauchy. But Cauchy, likewise, required only closure under product. But he did recognize the importance of the other axioms of group theory because he did introduce notations for the identity and for inverses. It was Arthur Cayley, who was the first to consider in 1854 the possibility of more abstract groups and the need to axiomatize associativity and he also axiomatized the identity property, but he still assumed that each group was finite and so had no need to axiomatize inverses, only the validity of cancellation. It wasn't until 1883, 50 years or more after Galois' work, that Walther, Franz, Anton von Dyck who studied the relationship between groups and geometry actually made explicit the mention of inverses.